December is known as a month of celebrations. And to that list of reasons to celebrate, we'd like to highlight one more reason to celebrate and express gratitude for caregivers. As you may or may not be aware, December is also recognized as National Family Caregivers Month. We expand that theme to include not just family members who are caregivers, but all caregivers. I'm Dr. Susan Chandler, Program Coordinator for the Integrative Health Program at VCU Health's Massey Cancer Center. As former First Lady Rosalind Carter once shared, there are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. For the next 30 minutes or so, we will be sharing the information with you, including local and national caregiver resources, which are all the more important to have as we battle the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me will be Debbie Schumacher. Debbie has walked this walk and continues even today as a long distance caregiver. She is a two-time cancer survivor, in addition to being a caregiver both before as she cared for her father as he underwent cancer treatment, and now for her mother as an elderly widow with multiple health challenges. Debbie is also a certified cancer coach and a certified patient navigator. She shares the tips she and her siblings have developed to adapt to caregiving both before and during the pandemic, and those tips include practical, financial, and emotional supports. At the end of Debbie's presentation, you'll hear from Frida Wilkins, an oncology licensed clinical social worker at Massey Cancer Center. Frida has also walked this walk as a caregiver for her late mother. In addition to her role as a team member of the Breast Health Center, Frida conducts a monthly support group for women with cancer and holds mindfulness meditation classes now over Zoom several times a month. She'll be helping you as a caregiver to create a safe place, a place you can go to escape and hopefully recharge your batteries without leaving the house. We hope caregivers will be inspired to use this technique called guided imagery as an outlet and a source of strength during these challenging times. Finally, you'll find a list of resources available to you as a caregiver. I encourage you to reach out if you need additional information or resources. After this initial presentation, you can go to the Massey Cancer Center website and enter Integrative Health in the search box to find this and other helpful resources. Thank you for being a caregiver. Before Debbie begins, I'd like to bring your attention to several national organizations, among them the American Cancer Society, the Cancer Survivors Network, and the American Red Cross. Caregivers have become an important focus for the American Cancer Society. Explore their web, website, it's simply www.cancer.org. You'll see their phone number here in case you don't have access to a computer or the internet. They have a wealth of resources, including some developed specifically for COVID-19. In addition, take a look at the Cancer Survivors Network and what they may have to offer, as well as the print resources produced by the American Cancer Society. These are my go-to resources when I'm looking for help for our patients, families, and caregivers. The American Red Cross wants to remind you to please remember to use healthy practices, wear your mask, wash your hands, and practice social distancing. As we're reminded when we fly, we have to put on our mask first in order to be of any help to others who need us. They also encourage you to create a team to help you. Debbie will speak more to this, but remember that there are people who want to help you and your loved one. Let them help. Identify in advance who you can call on for what, be it transportation, shopping, meals, whatever your needs are. Also, make plans in case you get sick. 
Until this pandemic is better controlled, we should all have a plan. Know who you can call on and let them know in advance what's needed and where things are that they might need to care for your loved one. Make lists, personal care, food allergies, special diets, along with names and contact information for the healthcare providers and the pharmacies you use. Try to limit your trips outside the home as much as possible. Remember, it's not just the person who needs your care, it's also you that need protecting. Use grocery delivery services and the internet for ordering items you need. The Red Cross recommends you have at least one month's supply of medications on hand, but also at least two weeks worth of groceries. While limiting your trips and contact with those outside the home is crucial right now, just as important is staying connected to others. Organize phone calls, drive-bys, Zoom meetings. Debbie will talk about how staying connected helps her mother. Unfortunately, during times of crisis, there will always be those who are ready to take advantage of us. Be vigilant. If something sounds too good to be true, such as a great price for paper products or hand sanitizer, it probably is. Don't give out personal information. Protect access to your financial and especially banking information. Finally, recognize your stress. Like so many things in our world, if we pay attention and try to manage our stress with healthy strategies, we will be the better for it. And now I'd like to introduce you to Debbie Schumacher. As Susan mentioned, we'll all be in a caregiving situation at least once in our lifetime or more. In my case, being a cancer patient put me in the shoes of needing caregiving. It also put me in the shoes of giving me a unique perspective for when my dad was going through his cancer treatment that I was able to help him figure out what care he might need, even if he didn't ask for it. So what I want to share is whether you are in town or across the country, there's a lot that you can do. In our case, um, I have two siblings on the West Coast and another sibling on the East Coast, so we're scattered about. And I want to share with you today some practical, financial, and emotional tips that we found helpful as we have gone through this caregiving journey. Uh, and hopefully there's something that you can use if you're taking care of a cancer patient or for anybody um, for that matter. Next slide, please. So first thing I'd like to just uh, mention, and I really recommend that you try to come to a place of, from a place of compassion for your parents, for yourself, and also for the other caregivers. Um, you know, in my case, this, my siblings, we are all grieving um, that our relationship with our parents is changing. It's not gonna be the same and life is not gonna be the same as we knew it. So there's some grief and just understand that as you go through the process. Uh, the first thing that we did was develop a plan and what made it so much easier was my sister and I actually had the luxury of spending some time with my parents on different occasions and together where we'd be there for a week or so at a time. And it allowed us to see how they lived. What could they do day to day? Um, what they thought they could do versus what they actually could do and how they spent their time. It also gave us a chance to start to have those real delicate uh, conversations of what are their wishes, where some of their financial papers are, um, and what their dying wishes are. And we also spent time reminiscing and sharing um, stories and memories, and that made it really fun too. Uh, but that allowed us to uh, then talk to our siblings, and we did a group family calls, which we included our parents. We didn't want them to think that we weren't, uh, we were doing anything behind their back. And their main wish was staying in the house at all costs. Um, they were pretty adamant about that. So um, that's not easy. We weren't aligned on that, but given that that was what they wanted, we really tried to create a plan for them. 
And I would say, as you create that plan, uh, don't fall into the trap of assuming that just because somebody's not working, they'll be able to fall in the caregiving role or because the person's closest in proximity. Uh, really set realistic expectations of what people can do. Um, you know, people have different bandwidths, they have different skills, they have different desires. And with us, it kind of fell naturally. I did a lot of the practical logistics. My sister's done a lot of the paying of the bills. Uh, one brother who is in the same town is there taking my dad to uh, his oncology re appointments, blood transfusions, um, being there when they fall and dealing with emergencies. And another brother is there doing things from afar and he adds actually some levity to the situation um, so that you don't get too serious in it. So um, just that's just a fun tip of as you start to plan it, um, not to make assumptions of who's gonna do what. And we put everything on a Google Doc spreadsheet. It just allowed us um, to all have access to it. So we broke down responsibilities into these three major um, buckets, practical, um, financial, and emotional. And so under the practical, there's three more buckets <laughs> that we came up with, safety, health, and nutrition. And safety, they need to be safe in their house. They were living alone. Uh, we got them a lifeline. You know, everyone loves their lifeline. Well, their cell phone service doesn't work well at the house. So that didn't work. We connected it to the internet. It worked, but guess what? They didn't want to use it. So what good is that? So we went to plan B. My brother um, got a camera monitor and he placed one where you could see them in the bedroom and the kitchen. My parents knew about it. And it was really there in case they fell that we could check on them and just make sure that they weren't on the ground um, and falling out of bed. We also hired caregivers and uh, that was for a few reasons, but one of them was safety because we realized they weren't taking showers and they were taking showers because they were afraid of falling. They didn't feel steady. So we needed uh, someone in there to help them with that and help them get dressed because their energy um, levels were low, especially my dad's with um, chemo treatment. And then on the health side, um, we, understood what their wishes are. We talked about it, but we found that we didn't have access to talk to their insurance companies or to their doctors because they hadn't granted it. So luckily, while they're still healthy, see if your parents can grant you that access because it makes it so much easier. And eventually we did get power of attorney, not to take control, but it allowed us to contact insurance companies on our own, and then we let our, the, our parents know how, what we're doing about it. And we would really ask them, um, how are you feeling? What's going on? With my dad, it was very easy since I had been in those shoes of understanding when he wasn't really thinking clearly, he was foggy, it wasn't dementia setting in, it was really chemo brain and gave me more understanding and patience as he tried to find that word that was kind of on the tip of his tongue, but he couldn't retrieve it. Um, and just understood like, okay, you feel crappy today, give into the rest and um, don't feel you have to do everything that was on your list. And so I think that, you know, just to open up the relationship. We also were able to, and Medicare actually paid for this for a while, was bringing in occupational therapy, physical therapy, and a nutrition consultant into the house. And that was just really helpful to build their strength and, and save their energy versus having to go somewhere. Uh, and we talked to the primary care nurse. We um, really tried to be, befriend her and explain our situation, how we're all apart, and we asked if a nurse could come and draw blood. And, um, and then she also gave us some resources too of her experience of dealing with other families in our situation. So use those. Um, this second um, bucket, nutrition. My dad had trouble swallowing. So my brother actually um, got him a Nutribullet and we taught him how to use it. Um, some days was successful, some days weren't, um, depended if how tight he would put the cap on it. But, you know, it gave a chance for him to have some smoothies. And um, another thing we did was we ordered meals. 
Uh, we would order meals from the diner when they just didn't have energy. We sent meals to them. We created care uh, meal plans for the caregivers, real simple things, but things we knew my parents liked to eat in terms of vegetables, fruits, and, you know, um, protein. Uh, we also learned over time to don't ask if they're hungry. When I'd say, do you want to eat? They'd often be like, no, I don't think I'm hungry or no, I don't want to bother you. But then I started just cutting up watermelon or cucumbers or cheese plate and putting it on the table and then going and making dinner or doing something. Lo and behold, the food was gone. They ate it, you know, and um, they were like, wow, that was good. So I learned to kind of be more, well, you want watermelon today or cucumber, you know, which, which what's your choice? And it was a great way for me to get some nutrition into them. Um, next slide, please. The other um, a larger bucket is um, financial considerations. Uh, we realized, because we had been there for a while, um, that bills and mail just were not getting taken care of. It was a little overwhelming. We created a system. We went over it with them when we left, came back a month later. Everything was still there. It was as if it had stopped in time. So we realized they just couldn't handle it. Um, on one occasion, we were there, my mom looked at the mail and handed it to us and said, this is all for trash. We looked at it. One was a letter from Talbot saying, we owe you $85. We just want to confirm that this is the correct address to send it to. Please confirm and you know put it in this self-addressed stamped envelope. Um, so we immediately did do that. And then another one was um, from an insurance company saying one of the agencies is no longer going to be covered by the insurance company. But my mom was gonna throw that out. So we realized we needed to transfer mail and bill paying um, to one of the siblings. And again, when we said, hey, we wanna transfer our mail, you know, would you like us to transfer the mail? We got the, no, we wanna look at the mail, no. You know, but then we, the next day we came back and said, well, we think we need to transfer the mail and here's why. We think it will take the burden off of you. We'll look at the bills, we'll get them paid. We'll look at anything pressing that needs to be taken care of. And the fun mail, like the cards and the magazines, we'll just send them to you, but you'll just get them a week later. And that's what we did. And um, after a few weeks, my parents were like, this is great. We're not getting bills. We really appreciate, um, they were grateful that we took that responsibility away from them. And, uh, you know, I talked about getting a power of attorney before it really helps to get a power of attorney for a bank account. It's not like you can have just a blanket power of attorney. You can, but with each agency, with each bank account, you have to um, show them your power of attorney. And some of them have specific forms to fill out. And some of them you need your parent to do it um, with you. So just if you can do it while they're healthy, that would be really um, beneficial because you'll need access to the bank account potentially down the road. And it's nice to just have it there. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is there's some local resources um, to just look into. You know, again, you could ask primary care nurse or friends in the area. But here at Richmond and at um, BCU Health, we have two wonderful resources that people may or may not know about. One is Cancer Link, and the other one is the Medical Legal Partnership. And both of these amazing organizations have legal volunteers, and they advocate for you. They can negotiate with insurance companies. They can write a will. They can put you in touch with other resources. And so um, just ask you know, and um, look around because you may find there, you don't have to take on everything yourself and you can maybe get some help doing it if you don't have the luxury of having some siblings. Uh, next slide, please. And the last bucket is emotional support, um, social support, because we all know connection is so important. Um, you know, it really is. And our home aides, play a huge role in this. Yes, they're keeping my um, parents safe and giving them some nutrition, but they're also there engaging with my parents. And over time, they formed a relationship. They're asking about each other's kids. They've often have met all of the children. So um, sometimes when I call, I'll say, you know, get on the phone with them and ask them, how's it going? What's my 
you know, how are they really doing? And uh, they'll give me the honest assessment that I don't always see when I look at the care log. And so um, I also noticed, you know, um, after the physical therapist is there, my mom's much more alert. She's had to be on for that hour of working, moving her muscles, and talking with someone, and then she's just much more engaged. And so you see the difference the social interaction plays in their mental attitude. And, um, you know, check-ins, that's not a surprise. We do regular calls. But the one thing we learned um, that might be interesting for you is we stagger our visits now. It's fun to visit with another sibling because we don't get to see each other as often. But um, we've learned to stagger those visits because it gives my parents something to look forward to. And they have a different relationship with each sibling. You know, like for instance, the last time I was there, one of the things my mom really wanted to do was get a manicure pedicure. My brothers aren't gonna take her to do that. They might drop her off, but this way we were able to do it together and it became an outing. And she was so excited. She got dressed, she had a full breakfast that day. She was talking the whole time. Um, afterwards, we went and got the flu shot. And then um, at dinner, she was like, that was a fun day. It was the most activity she'd had had the whole time I was there, but she was energized. And she was like, I'm sore, but I'm happy. And so um, just staggering those visits gives them something to look forward to and ask them what they want to do while you're there. And I know it makes it harder with COVID. Um, to actually visit and that's where zoom really has taken come into play and my parents were first reluctant i mean they're not tech savvy but luckily with a caregiver or a nephew they could get on and uh, they got dressed and they were excited they weren't totally engaged on zoom but they were enjoyed it as it was ending. They're going, that was so much fun seeing everyone, hearing the conversation. So it kind of gave them a shot in the arm. It gave them, again, positive energy. And I think that's a lot of what making a connection is all about. Um, so hopefully some of those um, tips might help you as you go on your caregiving journey. And I just, want to circle back to something that I talked about at the very beginning, which was trying to come from a place of compassion for the caregiver. Um, but it's really important to come from a place of compassion for yourself. It's really important. I know it's not easy to do, but you need to take care of yourself as the caregiver. Even when I'm in with where my parents are in Albany, um, New York, I know I need to get some get outside in fresh air, move, get some movement, or take 15, 20 minutes of quiet time, um, you know, when my mom's resting or watching TV, to just settle my mind and re-energize re myself. And it certainly helps that I can share responsibilities with other siblings and we can commiserate and laugh. Um, but if you don't have that, try to find what really works for you, because that's important to keep your energy, your immune system, and your stamina up. Unfortunately, as often happens in life, we've had to make a substitution for the presentation about guided imagery. Instead, we're sharing another mind-body technique, that of relaxation or focused breathing. The body is an amazing structure, especially when it comes to keeping us from harm. As an example, the harm from being in a chronically stressed out state, as many caregivers find themselves. Our nervous system has the ability to take us from the fight, fright, or flee state to one of calm and relaxation. All it takes to trigger this change is to alter our breathing. Buddhist practitioners and ancient yogis have been using this technique for thousands of years. Even the early Christian church used breath work in worship. Today, we most often find the use of breath applied to the practice of yoga, slowing our breathing to become more centered. And as poses are changed, breathing in and breathing out to the movements. More importantly, the benefits of breath work have been studied extensively for use in a variety of chronic diseases, beginning from Dr. Herbert Benson's study 
in the 70s of relaxation breathing in heart disease to its use for pain management, anxiety, and even the side effects of cancer treatments, among many others. What we know is that when we slow our breathing and breathe deep into our lower lungs and abdomen, the nervous system can slow the body's response to stress and other imminent threats by triggering the release of a number of neurochemicals and reactions deep inside our body. So let's get started by taking two deep cleansing breaths. Find a comfortable seat, sit up straight but not rigid. Your eyes can be open or if you're comfortable, softly focused in front of you or even closed. Place one hand on your abdomen and the other on your rib cage. So as you just breathe normally, you can feel your chest rise and fall. Or you could place both hands over your lower rib cage. Again, as you, as you inhale, feeling the rib cage expand. One thing I will remind you is that at the end of any practice, because you have been breathing deeply and you may be a little lightheaded, slowly open your eyes, wiggle your hands and feet and take your time standing up or if you're lying down, getting up. Please don't do it suddenly. So I like to think about relaxation breathing as happening in a cycle or circle. I invite you to inhale for a length of about two to three seconds, pause for one second, and exhale three to four seconds, taking another one second pause between before starting again. With time, you'll be able to inhale at a slower pace and exhale longer. But if you find that you're a little short of breath and only need to inhale for two seconds, that's okay too. We can just adjust. So when you're ready to begin, take a deep, slow breath through your nose and exhale. Now just follow the pattern of your regular breathing, not altering it, just breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out at your normal pace. You may find that thoughts come into your, your mind and, and that's okay, that's going to happen. Your mind is going to wander, but just keep coming back to your breath, breathing in breathing out at a normal pace. Now, when you're ready, I invite you to breathe in through your nose over a course of three seconds, hold it for one second, and slowly exhale either through your nose or mouth, just a little bit longer, maybe four seconds. Pause for a second, inhale, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Pause, exhale, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. Pause. Continue this cycle over and over. And I think that for beginners, um, try practicing at least once a day for at least three to four minutes. Initially, it may feel like a long time, but with practice, it will fly by. Again, a word of caution, take your time. Don't get up or stand up too quickly. This is a wonderful tool that you'll always have with you. Practice, it really helps, it creates muscle memory. It can be used any place, any time. You can practice it throughout the day very subtly. I found that this practice, along with the other, um, I hope that this practice, along with the other information we've shared, that you'll find helpful, uh, especially in your role as a caregiver. The final slide uh, has my, um, here is my email address if you have any questions. Uh, 
this slide refers to the research studies that have been done about relaxation or focused breathing. And finally, the last slide is a list of additional resources for caregivers. I invite you to reach out to us at Massey Cancer Center if you have questions. Please know that you are a blessing and we wish you strength, patience, and peace in your role as a caregiver. Thank you for your attention.